Welcome to another edition of the Smart Aviator Podcast. This is episode number four, and I'm here with Cy Pinkert, regular uh, Smart Aviator contributor, and uh, uh, captains a uh, Boeing 737, and in his off time flies a uh, twin Cessna 310 turbo. And uh, Cy, you know, you've been, you and I have been talking about this new technology that Garmin released a few months ago on its GTN 750XI navigator. Uh, it's a uh, VHF Datacom, and uh, the marketing has been a little bit confusing for a lot of buyers because they think by doing a software update, they can communicate with ATC, and ATC can communicate with them via text, but it's a little bit more involved than that, and what it is is a technology that a lot of people don't quite understand, CPDLC, which is uh, Controller Pilot Data Link Communication. You use it all the time at work, and I thought it would be uh, a worthwhile discussion here to educate the audience on exactly how this system works, some of its limitations, and uh, what to expect in the future. Yeah, Larry, you're right. Uh, It's not just taking that GTN 750 and doing the upgrade to the XI. Um, It's a little bit more involved. There's a little bit of hardware that you got to install in it. Uh, There's an altitude restriction that's going to eliminate a lot of our common GA aircraft in it. So we'll dive into a little bit of that. Yeah, not just a matter of doing a software update in a bonanza. Now you've got text capabilities between the airplane and ATC. Doesn't work that way. So uh, let's, let's, uh, let's go right into it. Yeah, I wish it did. It'd be too simple. <laughs> yeah. But I guess before we hop all the way into what it does, maybe we hop into a little bit of history on what CPDLC or Datacom is and how it's used and then we can dive into what what the issues are for our airplanes your rv my Cessna 310 and uh people in the mix that might have high performance doing long cross countries but can't really use this technology yet yeah you know you use the technology every day at work and you've probably sort of become used to it by now but it's really not new technology is it this this uh this data link uh or uh, data com vhf data com isn't a new concept no it's not it's been uh, don't quote me on the date but i think in 2012 it started as a dcl on the ground it's kind of like the pdc you get um for your clearance on the ground if you're subscribed through ForeFlight and you get the text message clearance it's really great you don't scribble down your clearance miss something because you don't know the name of vor um it's just sitting there on the screen you click accept off you go. Um, and it's evolved. Everything in aviation, all the technology we see evolving. And of course, it's evolved. Now you can get speeds and altitudes, uh, reroutes, your clearance, um, a multitude of messages. But it's not just a text messaging program. Um, it kind of rolls more into like going to a fast food restaurant, ordering off the menu. You're not customizing that hamburger you're getting from McDonald's. It's a pre populated amount of messages. Um, so you can't just ask for anything. Um, as the system evolves, there's going to be more messages that come to be fair game. But for now, it's really direct twos. Can I get a shortcut? Um, I need this altitude. Uh, a reroute is pretty much where I find the most use in it. Um, when I'm at my professional job, and you get this massive reroute while you're flying 2,000 miles across the country. And instead of scribbling it down, putting it in the FMS or in this case, a GTN 750 or a Garmin 5000 system. It just populates on the screen. You look at it, you load it, and off you go. So before we, before we get into real-world practical use, uh, this the system is altitude um, dependent, right? It won't work below 15, 16,000 feet? In a sense, um, kind of got to think of this as a... Uh, like a VOR service volume. Um, so the FAA looked at everything and determined that there's coverage at 16,000 feet that's substantial enough for everybody at that altitude to use it or higher. Below it, it's kind of a 50-50. There's some areas that can use it lower, some can't. So instead of having an airplane cruising at 14,000 feet kind of in and out of coverage, if you think of it as a VOR system, you kind of run out of of range on one side of the VOR, and then you've got a gap before you pick up the next VOR. It's kind of the same mentality there. And then instead of going 
out of the or being logged off the system because you don't have coverage anymore and logging back on they just said uh below 16,000 feet there's no service guarantee so they don't recommend using it if you're cruising below 16. yeah so what kind of communications are you using on a regular basis and talk me through a, a real world trip okay so you depart chicago or dallas or wherever and you 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 climb above uh 15 16, feet do you log in before takeoff or is it log in automatically or or how do you establish this uh text communication between the aircraft and air traffic control so we log in uh the logins kusa for everybody in the united states uh any operator any 135 operator airline we all use the same login uh, so you log in on the ground and if you're at an airport that supports uh, dcl on the ground you can get your clearance on the ground and then it kind of goes to a pending stage and you use voice for all your taxi uh, your takeoff and your departure and then once you get up to the first center usually um, you'll talk to them on on your initial check-in and then everything else will go through the cpdlc system um, so usually you check on with them they say roger and then when you get your next climb, that oftentimes comes through a CPDLC message. Every aircraft type is different. There's a multitude of avionics suites out there. So depending on what you have, you might get a ding dong, you, get, you might get a bell, you might get nothing. But it pops up on the screen and it might say climb flight level 300. And you click accept, dial in 300, keep your climb going. Um, and then a little bit down the line, you'll get a frequency change. So however it alerts you, you'll look at the message. And in uh, a lot of avionics, you for a frequency change, you see it, dial it in, you click accept, and then you check in with the next center. Um, I do believe Garmin, I might be wrong on this, but I think it'll load that frequency for you. So if I'm reading you correctly, this is a workload reducer or at least it can be, and obviously it, it, it clears up frequency chatter. Absolutely. So you're deleting frequency chatter. Um, I can request an altitude from ATC. They can give me an altitude. Um, so it reduces the chatter of just your traffic asking for a higher or lower altitude, asking for free, or not asking for a frequency change, but ATC initiating frequency changes. Um, and really, I mentioned it back a few minutes ago, but when you get a uh, reroute when there's weather, um, you can start getting all those reroutes via CPDLC. And uh, I'm sure you've heard, if you've flown around, you're in the, the Northeast, I'm sure you've heard it before, a five minute reroute from ATC. You miss one, one uh, VOR or one fix in there, and it's another five minutes of ATC chatter. And then multiply that by the chain of airplanes in line. Um, now it's just a button push. And, yeah. Uh, are you using it every flight and and has it become a pretty normal part of your ops? Yeah. So for uh, the GA, BA world and the uh, airline world, um, I'd say your turboprops your, and your jets, everybody's using it now that's equipped for it. And every month, if you go online to the FAA website and check it out, the numbers increase significantly on the number of aircraft that are using this technology. Yeah, and by Garmin opening up this interface on the hugely popular GTN 750XI, uh, that's going to mean more more participants, right? Yeah, you know, I just looked at the participation list just before we started this, and I was shocked to find the PA46. Uh, I believe that's the Malibu Meridian, uh, the M6700 as well, yeah, 500. Yeah, the turboprop um, uh, PA46 yeah. airframe, sure. Um, the Cheyenne. Um, a ton of turboprops are on there now that I hadn't seen in the past. So yeah, we're getting away from that idea that you need this multi-million dollar jet with a multi-million dollar avionics suite to use some of this technology. Yeah, worth mentioning too is that the uh, this GDR the Garmin box is VHF remote box is the uh, GDR sixty six series, and uh, it's got a list price of twenty thousand dollars, and. Garmin also has a uh, yearly subscription for something like $500. Um, right. And of course, that doesn't include your installation 
Yeah. But I couldn't imagine it's going to be cost prohibitive if you want to utilize this technology and you have an aircraft that's that's able to utilize it. Yeah. Uh, so what it, what do you see for limitations? Uh, you know, we, we know it can save chatter. It can it can save workload by having to repeat clearances or if you miss something in the clearance. But what are some of the drawbacks? You know, for for the GA fo uh, person flying around, if you're trying to use it to get clearances, uh, you not every airport supports it yet. Um, so uh, my my airport, I fly out of Broomfield, Colorado, um, at Rocky Mountain Metro. They don't support DCL on the ground, so you're still calling up and getting that clearance from the clearance frequency. So I'd say that's probably your main main drawback. Once you're airborne. It's a pre pretty seamless technology, but on the ground, we're still working with towers and facilities to get this technology in there. And it's just not, it's not across the whole NAS yet. Yeah, and you know, the, the big conversation has been uh, controller shortages and high controller workload. Uh, does this help, do you think? Personally, I think it does help, but there's also a training aspect on it. It's it's new to the pilot. The first time you use it, we look at it and we go, wow, that's cool. Let me figure out how this works. And if it doesn't work well, we just go to voice. Um, yeah. For the controller, they're, they've got a whole lot more airplanes than one in their airspace. And they get a couple days of training on it, I assume. And then off they go to the races. So the other drawback is if they're not comfortable with it, there's new controllers out there there's new pilots and they might just revert to voice because it's easier for them. Yeah. So I, I do think it'll help the situation. Um, and I know there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes to increase uh, ATC staffing, but it's just as technology grows, we got to get used to it, work the kinks out and get comfortable with it. And I think it's on both sides of the mic. Okay. So for those wondering about this GTN 750XI interface when it comes to CPDLC. Uh, the 750 is really only part of the system, right? Uh, we've also right. got the GDR66 remote transceiver. There's an antenna, and uh, there's also some software unlock from Garmin uh, to make it to make it all play. Correct. Yeah, I wish I wish it was easy enough just to say buy the GTN 750 get the latest update, stick it in the plane, let's go. But there's the the GTN 750XI is just kind of the, the the part that you see as the pilot. It's how you interface with the system, but there's a whole lot more that goes on behind it. Yeah. Uh, anything else you think uh, viewers want to um, know about uh, the system and where it can be? If you look into your magic ball, where do you, where do you see this system uh, a few years from now? You know, there's been this push for uh, overhaul of the ATC system. Do you think a voiceless aspect is uh, pretty much where all this is going? You know, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of talk going on behind the scenes about ATC modernization. I don't think we're ever going to go voiceless. Um, there, You always need that conversation piece. And not using voice in the in-route segment is always going to kind of cue you up to do my radios even work and you don't want to find out when you're shooting an approach that you can't talk to tower so i think we will always have some version of voice um and i don't know if this is ever going to make it to ground tower and approach control but for now in the in route segment i think it's a really cool piece yeah okay well we'll keep an eye on it and uh check back as the system uh develops for more of the market it's been uh, pretty common, I guess, in the uh, corporate and airline world. But uh, now that we're seeing more approvals for other airplanes, we're probably going to see a lot more of it. Yeah, my hope would be, if I could uh, toss out a few hopes, would be I hope that we can bring that service volume level down to a lower altitude and get more airplanes on it. I mean, we've got the Turbo 182, the C Turbo Cirruses, the tr Twin Cessnas, the Barons. I like to cruise high, go far. It'd be really cool to see uh, see it get a little more involved into the GA world. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing we always do on this podcast is uh, put the guest on the spot and talk about uh, 
favorite used airplanes. And if I were to guess, I think I know what your favorite used airplane is. You fly a turbocharged Cessna 310. Uh, give me a summary of the uh, Turbo 310. Uh, good, solid airplane, good go places airplane. But uh, what makes it one of your favorites? Yeah, you know, when we were looking to buy an airplane, um, the Cessna 340 was kind of the one in our aspect. Um, didn't work out for us. The Turbo 310R kind of fell in our lap. You know, it lifts a lot of weight. Um, it's not the FAA approved answer, but I kind of look at it and say, you know, I can take four adults, 100 gallons of gas and a suitcase, and I know I'm inside my weight and balance range. So that gives me about a 600 mile range with an hour reserve. It's pretty good doing 200 knots, three hours. Um, and it's a pretty easy airplane to work on. It's old. In old airplanes always have an issue, but the engines are kind of set up in a nice way where there's a lot of room for the mechanic to get in there. And it just, there's a lot of space, so. Yeah, for somebody searching the uh, used turbo 310 market or even normally aspirated 310s what advice might you have what are some gotchas you know uh the landing gear system is what everybody's going to talk about um there's a side brace kit for it um i i would say myself don't buy an airplane that doesn't have that side brace kit make sure your ad's are up to date and uh maintenance is a huge thing if maintenance has been neglected you're going to find yourself with that thirty forty thousand dollar annual um, I've never seen one that high. I'll count my lucky stars for that. But take a good look at the maintenance shops that have worked on the aircraft. And, and if it's a mom and pop, pop shop on the field, I I love those shops, but they might not be the best one to be working on that twin Cessna. Yeah. Well, we'll talk more about the uh, used twin Cessna market, particularly the Cessna 310, in an upcoming uh, report in Smart Aviator. We call it the Smart Plane Shopper. And we're looking for feedback for uh, folks that uh, own or have owned Cessna 310, any advice they might have for those uh, thinking about buying a 310, what it's like to own these airplanes, what it's like to maintain them, what it's like to fly them. We could use some feedback. So hit us here at the uh, Smart Aviator and uh, over at Abbrief. And uh, folks may recognize uh, Cy Pickert's name. Uh, we appreciate everything he does for it. He goes above and beyond with his reporting. And you've got a bunch of things in the mix for future reports, right, Cy? Yes, Larry. I, uh, right now we've got the Bose A30s. Um, we're testing those against those Lightspeed Zulu 4. Yep. I'm um, looking forward to putting out a report on that. Those are both phenomenal headsets. And uh, today I think the, the jet shades come. So we'll get those installed in the Cessna 310, do some testing on that, and report back on uh, on how we like those. Good. Well, thanks for the work, Cy. And uh, you've been watching the Smart Aviator podcast here on uh, Abrief. I'm Larry Anglisano here with Cy Pickert. Thanks for watching. Thank you.